Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events that have happened around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Thousands gather in Harare for an anti-Mugabe rally as reports claim the Zimbabwean president has refused to step down. Four days since the military takeover, political uncertainty worsens in the African nation. Over 500 people killed and nearly 7,500 injured in an earthquake on the Iran-Iraq border. Impact of the 7.3 magnitude earthquake felt across many areas in both countries. Kerman Shah in Iran, the hardest hit by the quake. India and the United States inch closer at ASEAN summit in Manila. In a bilateral meeting, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Donald Trump hold talks on issues ranging from defence to security issues in the Asia-Pacific region. And Italy miss out on a World Cup spot for the first time in over half a century. The Azzurri knocked out of the tournament after a playoff defeat against Sweden. Well, thousands of Zimbabweans took to the streets of Harare on Saturday to demand the resignation of Robert Mugabe. This comes four days after a military takeover in the southern African nation. Crowds gathered in Harare for the rally with some raising slogans in celebration and others holding up signs that read, Thank you, ZDF. A reference to the defence forces behind the military intervention. As questions remain on who is in charge of the nation, Mugabe emerged from house arrest on Friday to attend a university event. Several media reports claim that the 93-year-old has refused demands to leave office. Senior officials in the ruling party to call for his expulsion from the organization, along with his wife, Grace. Basically, we, this is Zimbabwe, Zimbabweans, we're saying to, to our army, thank you very much for the peaceful intervention. And it's time for the masses of Zimbabwe to say Mugabe must go and must go like yesterday. We can't wait to see his back. And uh, today's solidarity is, uh, consists of every Zimbabwean. For us, it's about uh, a new beginning. For us, it's about the end of a tyrant rule. And uh, we are going to take our Zimbabwe back. This flag, my guy. Well, the military had intervened on Wednesday, setting off a chain of events that plunged Zimbabwe, a nation that Mugabe has led for 37 years, into political uncertainty. The military action followed Mugabe's dismissal of his powerful vice president, Emerson Mangagwa, who, according to media reports, the military wants as the new leader. Here's how the political drama began. A short military broadcast on national television adding more uncertainty in Zimbabwe. The spokesperson for the military asked citizens to remain calm and assured things would be back to normal after the military completed its mission. We are only targeting criminals around him who are committing crimes that are causing social and economic suffering in the country in order to bring them to justice. As soon as we have accomplished our mission, we expect that the situation will return to normalcy. The military has refused to call this a coup, but political parties and observers claim this is one and worry that Mugabe's future is in the hands of the military. Since Tuesday night, the streets of Harare have been quiet with just military presence and few people on the roads. To both our people and the world beyond our borders, we wish to make it abundantly clear that this is not a military takeover of government. What the Zimbabwe Defense Forces is doing is to pacify a degenerating political, social and economic situation in our country, which if not addressed, may result in a violent conflict. We call upon all the war veterans 
to play a positive role in ensuring peace, stability and unity in the country. The sudden appearance of soldiers in Harare comes amid rising political tensions after Mugabe's shock sacking of his deputy, the powerful Vice President Emerson Manangakwa. Manangakwa had previously been considered most likely to succeed Mugabe if the President stepped down or died in office. His sudden dismissal cleared the way for Mugabe to appoint his wife Grace to the position, prompting widespread discontent among former Loyalist supporters. We were used to the political situation that was here before. Now this new development might affect our livelihoods and we are unsure what it will bring. We had no one telling us what to do and we were under the protection of ruling ZANU-PF party. Throughout this situation, all we hope for is peace. We don't want to be disturbed in our daily work, we want to survive. Against a background of increasing uncertainty, the United States, Canada and United Kingdom issued warnings to their citizens inside Zimbabwe. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Well, joining me for a chat uh, this week to talk about this is former Ambassador Virendra Gupta. Ambassador, thank you for joining me on the program. Welcome. You know, as far as this whole political crisis in Zimbabwe is concerned, were you surprised at all at the nature of the coup, if we can call it that? Because it seems like a soft coup. The, the military has very clearly said that they are uh, in no mood to take control over Zimbabwe. They want to hand it back to the people and hand it back to the democracy. Well, it points to a trend that I've been observing in uh, Africa. Uh, it is surely a military intervention. There is a lot of uncertainty. But it hasn't progressed into a full-scale military coup. And I think the reason is very clear, is that uh, we don't accept it. But there is a growing maturity. And uh, democracy is taking roots in, in Africa. Uh, so there is increasing intolerance for uh, military coups. Uh, I remember about two, three years ago, there was some attempt in Lesotho, mm. where I happened to serve as ambassador concurrently based in South Africa. And the military coup had to be reversed because of intervention by senior African leaders. Uh, Africa is now asserting to find solutions to its own problems. Now, this is a Zimbabwe is a very classic example. I'm, I'm no, personally no great fan of uh, Mugabe. Mm. He has ruled long enough and I think the leaders must uh, yield place to other people, other generation or younger people. Uh, but there is a huge distinction, there's a huge gap between how the Western countries and the Western uh, influenced media uh, perceives Mugabe and how he's regarded in his own country mm. by Zimbabweans. I can tell you, I've seen Mugabe on at least four different occasions at the gathering of African leaders in Africa, and he was the tallest. He was the most popular. Uh, so there is, you know, this, this smells of an attempt to regime change. And I think we cannot accept it. Africa doesn't accept it. You know, at this very moment, South African uh, government is you know, that was trying to, be, to find a solution. That was going to be my next question to mm. you, in fact. What are the kind of implications it's going to have on the African continent? Well, uh, the statement coming out from President Zuma uh, stresses the fact that they want to find a solution within the Constitution. You see, politically, uh, you know, we are talking about inclusive democracy. We uh, are repeatedly uh, saying that uh, solutions should not be imposed from outside. And yet, the Western countries do not uh, desist from uh, doing something like that. They have done so in the Middle East, uh, Libya, you know, Gaddafi was thrown out. Gaddafi was similarly, you know, much despised uh, despotic leader. But then uh, the regime change was sponsored in, in Syria. Uh, the regime change uh, attempt of the Western countries to cause regime change almost uh, created a bigger monster. Yeah. Uh, ISIS uh, was very largely a creation of uh, uh, the kind of effort that uh, the Western countries were making. And then and, they had and, to... And we've all seen what's happened with Iraq. Sure. And, and then they had to abandon that attempt, uh, lest uh, ISIS became stronger. So uh, this uh, thing about Western countries... See, Mugabe 
has raised some very, very relevant issues in Zimbabwe, hmm. the issue of land reform. After all, when the uh, whites came over there, settlers, and they took control of the uh, country, the whole land distribution was skewed. Uh, a small white minority got to uh, you know, be in possession of very large uh, segment of the land. And Mugabe asked for it to be changed. And I think that is why Mugabe became a villain hmm. in the eyes of uh, those settlers. And through the settlers, the uh, former Britain. colonial power Britain and uh, British uh, cohorts. Sure, sure. You know, what are the options now uh, before Robert Mugabe? Because let's not forget he's 93 years old. There are protests on the streets of Harare asking him to step down. His own political party too is, you know, is upping the pressure against him. So what are his options really? You see, political, I believe that he's still uh, the most popular person um, within his own party. So I don't think constitutionally uh, there would be any, uh, you know, no matter what kind of rallies and things. These are all doctored. You know, you, media can pick out uh, uh, the kind of rallies, the kind of voices that they want to project. Uh, now, constitutionally, I think if he's got a little bit of term left, uh, he could be allowed to continue. Uh, uh, the, the African leaders, and I think the important thing is to, is to leave the Africans to find a solution to this problem because they understand uh, the psyche uh, of uh, the people over there uh, in the best possible manner. Uh, sacking of uh, the vice president a week ago uh, probably was unfortunate and uh, the constitutionality of that uh, and the appropriateness of that uh, needs to be examined. So I think a compromise solution uh, within the constitutional framework, that's what South Africa has promised. And I think the whole Africa will back that. Uh, and, and that is, again, when I come back to it, the reason why the military leadership in Zimbabwe, uh, despite the backing of Western nations, has not been able to carry its military coup through is because they know that if, if they do it, they will have no uh, approval uh, from Africa. Sure. So I think they will have to probably find some way of reinstating uh, the sacked uh, vice president, allow uh, Mugabe an honorable exit, maybe after uh, one year, and a deal is made that uh, he will not uh, contest any more elections. So some, so some kind of a compromise formula is what you're suggesting yes. at this point in time. We'll have yes. to wait and see what really happens in Zimbabwe in the days to come. Thank you so much, uh, Virendra Gupta, for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for Welcome. us. Well, moving on now, a strong 7.3 magnitude earthquake rocked the Iran-Iraq border region late last Sunday. The powerful earthquake has killed over 500 people and injured around 7,500. Iran's Kerman Shah province has been the worst hit. Here's a detailed report. destruction on the Iran-Iraq border, buildings reduced to rubble, chaos at hospitals. People fled the safety of their homes as the powerful 7.3 magnitude earthquake shook the Iran-Iraq border region on Sunday night. Hundreds were killed while thousands are injured. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake was centered 31 kilometers outside the eastern Iraqi city of Halabja, about 350 kilometers north of Baghdad. However, the border town of Sarpole Zaheb in Iran's western Karmanshah province was the worst hit. This is the moment the devastating earthquake struck the region, captured live on Kurdish TV Rudor during a news show on Sunday night. Sending tremors that were felt as far away as in Turkey and Pakistan. I flew from the balcony down. It was very strong. The debris hit my arm and it wounded me. The earthquake shattered the window and it fell on me and it wounded my hand and my face. 
The most extensive damage in Iraq was in the town of Darbandi Khan in the semi-autonomous Kurdistan region. The quake was felt across Iraq, shaking buildings and homes from Irbil to Baghdad, while at least 14 provinces in Iran have been affected. Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini offered his condolences and urged rescuers and all government agencies to do all they could to help those affected. I did not wish for my visit to be at a time when our people are today experiencing a tragedy and suffering a disaster. I am hopeful that I will return during happier and more prosperous days to serve our dear and courageous people who have been an asset to our dear country. I would like to express my sympathies primarily to our brothers in the region and also to the people of Iraq and Iran. I would like to offer my condolences for those who died and I wish for recovery of the wounded. Being the first nation to respond, Turkey has dispatched humanitarian aid to the earthquake hit areas in Iraq, including sending out beds, blankets, tents and heaters. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, it's time for a short break now. Still to come, Russia vetoes Syria chemical attacks probe. That and much more on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. One of the most influential revolutionaries of Indian freedom struggle, Shaheed Bhagat Singh. Born into a Sikh family, patriotism flowed in his blood at the age of 13. When he formed Naujawan Bharat Sabha to spread the message of revolution in Punjab. In the wake of avenging Lala Lajpat Rai's death, Bhagat Singh and his associates coined the catchphrase Inkalab Zindabad. But towards the end of their rebellion, they had to pay a heavy price for their patriotism. Following the blasts inside the corridors of the assembly, both Bhagat Singh and Batukesh Vardak caught a arrest. Bhagat Singh was sent to the gallows in Lahore with his fellow comrades, after which he was cremated in Hussainiwala on the banks of Satluj. Hello and welcome. I'm Amritan Sharai and you're watching Law of the Land. A lot of Australians are working even in Indian sports nowadays. So in the different teams are also having a lot of Australian support staff. The sports is not something which uh, you perform in the spur of the moment. We are going to start the uh, National Sports University uh, from this year itself. The government of India should consider inviting foreigners or people who are excellent in sports. Watch Law of the Land on Raji Sabha Television. Welcome back. You're watching World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Donald Trump held a bilateral meeting on Monday on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit. The two leaders held expansive talks in which they carried out a broad review of the strategic landscape in Asia. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Donald Trump engaged in a wide-ranging bilateral meeting in Manila on Monday. The talks ranged from defence to security issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Prime Minister Modi said the relationship between India and the US goes beyond mutual interest and can be beneficial for Asia and humanity at large. Bharat and America 
गहरे और व्यापक हो रहे हैं और आप भी अनुभव करते होंगे कि भारत और अमेरिका के संबंध सिर्फ भारत और अमेरिका के हितों से ऊपर उठ करके हम साथ मिलकर के एशिया के भविष्य के लिए काम मिलकर के काम कर सकते हैं विश्व में मानव जात के लिए हम क्या भला से काम कर सकते हैं ऐसे अनेक विषयों पर हम मिलकर के चल रहे हैं भारत की विश्व को जो अपेक्षाएं हैं अमेरिका की जो अपेक्षाएं हैं भारत उसको खरा उतरने में भरपूर प्रयास करता रहा है और करता रहेगा The US president described the prime minister as a friend and a great gentleman. He also used the opportunity to congratulate Modi for creating a conducive business climate in India. Prime Minister Modi here. We've had him at the White House and he's become a friend of ours and a great gentleman doing a fantastic job in bringing around lots of factions in India bringing them all together. That's what I hear and Uh, that's good news. Later in the day Prime Minister Modi also met Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte. Both leaders discussed the security situation in the South China region. Bureau report Rajya Sabha TV. Well, much else has unfolded around the world this week. Here's a quick round up of some other international news in Globe Watch. A North Korean soldier involved in an extremely rare and dramatic defection to the south was shot six times by his own side as he drove to the heavily guarded border and ran across under a hail of bullets. The US-led UN command which monitors the Panmunjom border where the defection occurred on Monday said the soldier had driven close to the heavily guarded military demarcation line separating the two Korea An official with the South Korean Joint Chiefs of Staff said the North's border guards fired at least 40 rounds. Russia vetoed a UN Security Council resolution that would have extended an international inquiry into chemical weapons attack in Syria. It's the 10th time Moscow has used its veto powers at the UN in support of its allies since the conflict began. US ambassador to the UN Nikki Haley accused Russia of undermining the organization's ability to deter future chemical attacks. The Russian ambassador dismissed the criticism. Theresa May launched her strongest attack on Russia yet, accusing Moscow of meddling in elections and carrying out cyber espionage. Addressing leading business figures at a banquet in London, the Prime Minister said Vladimir Putin's government was trying to undermine free societies. May said it was planting fake stories to sow discord in the West. Her comments are in stark contrast to those of US President Donald Trump, who last week said he believed President Putin's denial of intervening in the 2016 presidential election. US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has called for an independent investigation into Myanmar's Rohingya crisis. Myanmar's army has been accused of killing Rohingyas and burning their villages, forcing thousands to flee to Bangladesh. Tillerson said the crisis concerned the US but added that sanctions against Myanmar would not advisable at this time. His comments came after he met Aung San Suu Kyi and Myanmar's military. International pressure has been mounting for months on Suu Kyi to condemn the army's alleged brutality and what the UN described as textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Australians overwhelmingly voted in favor of legalizing same-sex marriage in a historic poll. The non-binding postal vote showed 61.6% of people in favor of allowing same-sex couples to wed. The billion supporters have been celebrating in public spaces, waving rainbow flags and singing and dancing. A bill to change the law was introduced into the Senate late on Wednesday. It will now be debated for amendments. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said his government would aim to pass legislation in Parliament by Christmas. Well, let's now shift gears and bring you up to speed with all the sports news you might have missed this week in sports action. Four times champions Italy failed to reach the World Cup for the first time since 1958 after a playoff defeat against Sweden. It means the Azzurri will not be present in the competition for only the second time in their history having declined to play at the inaugural tournament in 1930. Midfielder Jakob Johansson's deflected strike in the first leg was the difference as the second leg at Milan's San Siro stadium ended goalless. Sweden sat back on their advantage and despite the hosts enjoying 76% possession they failed to find the breakthrough 
Australia qualified for their fourth successive World Cup by beating a physical Honduras 3-1 at Stadium Australia in Sydney. After a goalless first leg, Aston Villa player Mile Jedinak's 53rd minute free kick took a decisive deflection off Henry Figuerera to break the deadlock. Jedinak then drilled in penalties after a handball by Brian Acosta and a foul by Johnny Palacios to seal victory. Menor Figuera bundled in late on, but it was too late for the visitors. Australia handed a surprise call up to wicketkeeper Tim Payne for the first Ashes test against England. The 32 year old, who has not been keeping for stateside Tasmania, last played a test in 2010. Opener Matt Renshaw is left out in favour of uncapped 24-year-old Cameron Bancroft, while batsman Sean Marsh earns a recall and is set to bat at number 6. The first test at the Gabba in Brisbane begins on the 23rd of November. England hold the Ashes after winning the 2015 series. World number 1 Rafael Nadal pulled out of the ATP Finals and brought an end to his season after defeat by Belgian 7th seed David Goffin in his opening round-robin match. Nadal said before the tournament his knee was not perfect but fought hard before losing 7-6, 6-7, 6-4. The Spaniard described it as a miracle that he took Goffin to three sets over two and a half hours. Nadal is however guaranteed to end the year as the world number one and will now concentrate on recuperation before preparing for the new season. Michael Schumacher's final Monaco Grand Prix winning Ferrari collected $7.5 million at an auction in New York making it the most valuable modern era Formula 1 car ever sold at auction. The F2001 that took Schumacher to the fourth of his seven F1 World Championships in 2001 was auctioned off at the Sotheby's Contemporary Art Evening Sale in Manhattan. A portion of the proceeds from the sale will be donated by the former owner to Michael Schumacher's Keep Fighting Foundation. And finally, Germany got into the spirit of the foolish season in Cologne with an annual street party marking the start of Carnival. Every year on the 11th of November at 11 minutes past 11 o'clock, thousands of Carnival revelers gather to kick off the festival, one of the biggest in all of Europe. Cologne is at the centre of Carnival celebrations, staging the biggest and most famous events attracting visitors from afar. I'm going to leave you this week with the visuals from Germany. Until next time, this is Frank Pereira signing off.